Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, The Importance of Metadata, sponsored today by Top Quadrant. It is the latest installment in a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to chat, highlight your questions via Twitter using hashtag data ed. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And to open and access either the Q&A or the chat panels, you may find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, so we may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To answer the most commonly asked questions, as always, we will send a follow-up email to all registrants within two business days containing links to the slides. And yes, we are recording and will likewise send a link of the recording to, of this session, as well as any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to Jesse for a brief word from our sponsor, Top Quadrant. Jesse, hello and welcome. Thanks, Shannon. And hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm with Top Quadrant. And Peter's going to talk to you about all things metadata. What I want to do with you is share an approach, a unique approach for modeling, capturing, and leveraging this metadata. Semantic graph standards and technology can be used to form what we call knowledge graphs. Knowledge graphs of your interconnected who, what, where, when, how, and whys. And all of those dimensions will make a lot more sense to you as Peter works through his slides. But uh, the knowledge graph approach using semantic graphs is the unique capability of our top grade edge system. Top Quadrant is uh, an enterprise data management company. We help large enterprises to better use, understand, and deploy their metadata. We serve some of the largest companies in the world with essential point solutions, such as tagging social media and optimizing feeds, and even up to very large data fabric deployment that cut across the entire topology of a business. Our success is about getting you live and solving real problems. The principle that we operate under is that enterprise knowledge graphs have a purpose. It's not enough to get our technology in your hands or even into the right hands. It's about using that technology, those knowledge graphs to leverage the metadata to make an impact. And we go on that journey from beginning to end. We call it our go live process. We partner closely with our customers to ensure that we can drive to real business outcomes. It starts with pairing you with experts to see the power of graphs to enable your organization to save money, uh, save time, minimize risk, and develop new products quickly and safely. Customer success due to our top rate edge system comes in many forms but includes increased collaboration because of the workflow engine and the version control capabilities of the platform, uh, enhanced discoverability and faster reporting times, both of those because of the semantic, very rich, meaningful representation of that metadata and being able to query it and even infer extra data from it. Um, and even an in, a decreased in storage costs, because in many ways, metadata weighs a lot less than data does. With that being said, what metadata do you have that could form rich knowledge graphs representing your enterprise? And can you do it in a way that's highly leverageable and governable? That's what our top rate edge system is about. We stand behind semantic web standards and use those through and through. If you want to learn more about our platform or even the semantic web standards, you can always reach us at topquadrant.com. Everyone have a great day. And we're back to you, Shannon and Peter. Jesse, thank you so much for this great presentation. If you have questions for Jesse and about Top Quadrant, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion of your screen as he will be joining us in the Q&A at the end of the presentation today. And now let me introduce to you our speaker for the webinar series, Dr. Peter Aiken. Peter is an acknowledged data management authority as associate professor at Virginia Commonwealth University, president of DAMA International and associate director of MIT International Society of Chief Data Officers, 
For more than 40 years, Peter has learned from working with hundreds of data management practices in more than 30 countries, including some of the world's most important. Among his 12 books are the first, Making the Case for Data Leadership, CDOs, the first focusing on data monetization and on modern strategic data thinking, and the first objectively specific to uh, first to objectively specify what it means to be data literate. International recognition has resulted from these and a pre-COVID-19 intensive worldwide event schedule. Peter has also hosts the longest running data management webinar series from Dataversity, which is very true. We're in our 13th year, Peter, I think. <laughs> Starting before Google, before data was big and before data science, Peter has founded several organizations that have helped more than 200 organizations leverage data specific savings have been measured at more than 1.5 billion US dollars. His latest is anything awesome. And with that, let me turn everything over to Peter to get his presentation started. Hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. And I think our time's going a little too fast. We're probably in our 12th year instead of our 13th. But, uh, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure all along. And, and uh, thanks to everybody for joining us today and taking some time out of your schedule to spend about 90 minutes here learning about the importance of metadata. Let's drive right into the program. Uh, first of all, Overview wise, we're going to talk about what metadata is in the context of data management. The two terms are interoperable and interdependent in that sense. Uh, then there are four specific strategies that I'm encouraging you to adopt as you begin your metadata journey or continue on it. The first one is to do not treat the word metadata as a noun. If that's not clear, we'll hopefully make it up by the time we get to the end of this. Uh, second is to make sure that your data governance groups are speaking exclusively in metadata. Third, to treat repositories or glossaries as a capability, not as a technology. And finally, don't start your metadata process unless you first examined what available building blocks are out there that you can get a hold of. Notice I've said many, many, many resources available to that. We'll finish up about an hour from now with a little bit of benefits, applications, and sources in there, and then get to the part where we'll invite Jesse back on to talk about the takeaways, keys, and and everything else that goes into this. And I, I just want to, again, say how grateful I am for the community out here. This was a slide that I got back in response from uh, Peter Campbell. Thank you, Peter, for uh, sharing this. When I sent out the advert for this program, which was a set of uh, uh, file cabinets. And Peter sat back and just said, just as an FYI, uh, this is actually something that was done fairly early on uh, around here where they were trying to classify the world's knowledge. And this little repository here that you're looking at is in fact available online. Uh, unfortunately, it's called the mundane, uh, which stands for mundane, uh, sort of an interesting uh, choice of words that they used uh, around that. But it does represent one of the earliest known and probably most successful efforts to manage metadata on a wide scale basis. So let's start off, of course, with the term metadata. In language, when we haven't figured out how to do words, exactly right. We stick a hyphen in between them. So it was like, well, we need something meta and it's got to do with data. So we'll call it meta dash data in there. Over time, that hyphen gets lost. And so now we have graduated, thank goodness, to the word metadata all in one term. Although you'll see a little bit later on, we didn't quite get it into the Dimbach in time in there. And just another little piece. Uh, there is actually somebody that owns a copyright on the term, but obviously it cannot be enforced. That's one of those oopsies that the uh, uh, Patent and Trade Office occasionally makes an error on there. I think one of the main problems with metadata is that people don't understand the context within which it is used, and that is because they don't understand what it means to talk about data management. So first of all, the left-hand side is the way people often think about it. We're just going to go through all these books and reference them. You know, it's a great thing. Or if we label everything, we'll get it all right. Or I'm not sure what Microsoft was attempting to show, but this is an actual Microsoft advertisement here where they're marking things up on a restroom door. It doesn't say much about us. But what I think I think we can all agree on is that data is not broadly or uniformly understood. It depends sort of where you start from. It's like the blind people at the elephant. Uh, different parts of the elephant come in contact with the blind individuals, and uh, so they end up with a, a different perception of what it is. And similarly, in data, it happens as well that you think data is largely about the point in which you've 
crude to it uh, in there. Uh, it's really, we have as an industry to continue to work on this. And this is why I'm so happy we have such a, a vibrant community. Somebody will likely send me something here. But we used to call data management everything between when data is sourced and when it is used. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't tell us much about the process. So while it's probably a true statement, we need to refine it a little bit. And the first thing that we really need to change in here is that it's not just about using data, but about reusing data. Because if we just use it uh, one time, it's probably not as valuable or as leverageable as we'd like it to make. Uh, we're working on a newer definition for it that tries to encompass that sort of elephant in the room here. Uh, and it's the idea that data is divided up into some preparation and some exploitation types of activities in here. And I've just listed a couple of them across there. In addition to that, of course, we need to have a formal reuse management system. If we don't engineer the data so that it is available to be reused, it will will not likely be reused. Instead, it will be used a second time through an entirely much more expensive process. Uh, data preparation time means 80% of our time is spent in that preparation, the left-hand side of this particular piece, and 20% uh, in the analysis piece. And of course, it's all got to be governed by an ethical use framework within that particular context. So I'm still trying to define data management here. Let's dive in and look at the word meta in particular. There are lots of definitions here. The one I'm highlighted in purple here is beyond transcending, more comprehensive at a higher state of de development. And here are our card catalogs that we look at. Now, I know that some of you are young and we have to tell you the card catalogs is in a library. That was a place where you traveled to physically in order to access reference materials before Google. Then you had to manually search through this card catalog for subjects by reading abstracts and other information that's printed on these three by five index cards and organized in a fashion the cards also contained a link to a physical address of where the reference material was in the library. And again, these reference cards identified what are the books, where are they located. Uh, you can search it by subject, by author, by title. The catalog shows, uh, again, relevant information around each of these that allows you, allowed us in the old days to determine which books helped us to meet the user's requirements. And without the catalog, finding things was difficult time consuming and frustrating and quite frankly impossible uh, at the time as well. So we're gonna go with our first definition of metadata of data about data. And if you take a particular piece of data, you can make lots of metadata about that. A good place to look around your own organization is that you have a group likely in your organization that is already maintaining metadata about users who access your network. So you could go to your network group and ask, who is the person who is responsible for determining which devices are permitted to log on to your network or which individuals or at what access points? And when they do access, what are they allowed to get? Again, there's probably a named individual in your group somewhere that takes care of this. Find out, and, and now you have somebody who's doing metadata management within your networking group, uh, and it gives you a little bit of a benchmark. Uh, for example, I've, I've worked for a lot of organizations before, and I found one that had five people that were in charge of this particular piece. It's a pretty big responsibility, a large user base in this case. And then I said, well, if you've got five people determining whether or not people are allowed to get onto your network or not, and you've only got three people keeping track of your data, it doesn't seem like the right number, does it? And they agreed with me on that particular piece. So now that we have data and metadata, what do we want to do with it? And the thing we want to do with it is to leverage it. So you'll notice here I have a lever uh, set up in this case. Uh, again, a one kilogram uh, ball cannot balance that uh, other one, but if I make it larger, it can get there. So again, we can move more with less, which is the definition of leverage all the way around. And of course, if I keep increasing the ball, it increases the leverage on that. The way to think about it in terms of data is that you've got a bunch of data on the left-hand side of that equation, and you've got some technologies that you'd like to have. In the instance that I'm showing here, you're looking at the fulcrum excuse me, and the lever, the lever and the fulcrum. The lever is the triangle, the fulcrum is the uh, the, the ruler-like thing that we're looking at there. So that's our use of technology here. Again, if you didn't know how to do this, uh, it would be very difficult even with this set of 
proper technologies. Of course, we've got people in your organization. I call these all of your knowledge workers supplemented by your data professionals that are in there. And there is some sort of a process, although likely because most organizations have not adopted uniform ways of describing this, your process that you have here will be one that is pertaining to work groups as opposed to the organization, which means your opportunity for standardization is significantly less. Again, notice the three legged stool there of people, process, and technology in order to do this. Uh, of, going, of course, you could do everything with your processes, so you use strategy to guide the particular process. And I'm going to add another word in here too, rot. Rot is data that is redundant, obsolete, or trivial. And if you can reduce the amount of redundant, obsolete, or trivial data that you have, you will increase your data leverage. Of course, the Bottom line to this is that metadata is a primary means of applying leverage to data in this case. Data leverage is a multi-use concept. It permits organizations to manage their data both within the organization and when they are exchanging data with their various partners in support of the mission. Leverage is again enabled by metadata. It permits implementation of what we call data-centric technologies, processes, and human skill sets, focusing on the non-redundant, obsolete, and trivial data. The bigger the organization, the greater the leverage potential, of course, exists. And treating data more asset-like simultaneously reduces IT costs and increases knowledge worker productivity. Again, metadata is your key to all this process. So when we look at this, again, a little bit deeper dive in the rot area right now, one of the things you have to understand, of course, is that some of your data is worth more than other parts of your data. It's a separating of the wheat from the chaff. And the first question that comes up is, is well-organized data worth more? Well, the answer to that question is quite simple. Before the information age, we had, of course, books that had all sorts of metadata in them to help understand the books. Imagine if instead of handing you a well-bound book with page numbering and indices and things, I instead handed you a bunch of pages. And without a backing on those pages, the knowledge on those pages disappears pretty quickly. Uh, so clearly there is value to having data well organized. Uh, again, I'll put a little shout out to Abby Covert's wonderful book, How to Make Sense of Any Mess, a good book about the need for information architecture for non-information architects. So once again, 80% of organizational data is rot, redundant, obsolete, or trivial data. And the question becomes which to eliminate. Well, metadata is required for the identification of those assets. It's required to focus attention on repairing common data assets. Those are the ones you want to fix first if they're sh shared, of course. And it permits value to be ascribed to the data at the necessary granular level that occurs. So then the question comes up, all right, if we're going to do this, who is best qualified to do this? And the answer is a combination of your data people coupled with your business users uh, in this particular instance. So I've got a, a repetition here in this particular talk, metadata yields, what do we get? Well, you can ask the question, do we have this specific or this class of data assets, yes or no? Uh, what is the quality of these? Well, in this case, it's been judged not suitable. What will the cost be to improve this class of data assets? With the right metadata, you can provide an answer that says 35 cents a piece times 6 billion or whatever the number is that you have. And can these assets be provided more granularly in this particular instance? The answer is no. Now, if you haven't seen this diagram before, uh, welcome to our world. Uh, uh, this is the Dema Dimbach uh, wheel that we talk about showing 11 practice areas in there. And once again, you can see I've circled in yellow the metadata practice area ranked as one of the, the top areas that we look at. Notice, of course, we spelled it wrong, but that's a, a minor detail. We'll get it right in the next edition uh, on this. And from the Dimbach, they have a overall diagram here that talks about this. I would read this to you if I just wanted to cheaply do nothing else for the rest of this particular piece, but I'll leave that for you guys to do and instead show you an example of how metadata is used in an MP3 app. This is the app called, used to be called iTunes. I think on Windows it still is called iTunes. On the Macs they now call it music. And let's just see what happens if I take a CD back in the days when we had CDs and I stuck the CD in my CD player in my computer, music, the app would come back and tell me how many tracks. I have 25 tracks on this. And it also tells me the length of each track. Well, that's useful information, but it's 
probably not what we're really looking for in terms of managing music. So one of the next things that happens, of course, Apple and others connected this up to a piece called gracenote.com, which is the Gracenote media database. And through a fingerprinting operation, it runs out there, grabs this information and brings it in and labels the songs that are on the CD, it gives me the artwork that's associated with it. It sure would be a pain to type in all of this information. And of course, with limited exceptions, we end up with good results from here. However, occasionally uh, you do end up with a question back from Gracenote that says, is it this album or this album? I can't tell uh, on that. Now let's take this metadata management example just a step further. I've now taken tracks and turned them into songs and times and artists and artwork and things. Now I wanna group them. I wanna group some like things together. I wanna to put all of my Miles Davis recordings together in this case. And so to organize it, I create a smart list for an artist containing Miles Davis. However, when I did that, it actually showed me results that I didn't get what I was desiring. I had another Miles Davis CD that I had forgotten called Live at the Fillmore East in there. And so I need to fine tune that and say, I don't want just artists containing Miles Davis, but artists containing Miles Davis and album containing the complete birth of the cool in order to do this. And I can move it to a folder or I can do something else with it. By the way, most of your MP3 players already have this built in. So everything that I've showed you here is completely redundant. It does this automatically for you when it brings in the CDs, puts it in there in an album with these particular pieces. So there would be no point in this, but there might be a point in collecting all my Miles Davis together if I wanted to make a Miles Davis playlist. Uh, in order to do this. This same architecture of metadata, the arrangement that we have, does now work for the interface, the processing, and the data structures applied to podcasts, movies, books, PDF files, and the economies of scale are just enormous. Again, the leverage that we get from this is enormous. So now you all know how to take your MP3 app and show somebody else a use of metadata around that particular application. Once again, we get back to our metadata yields. It yields valuable information about your musical assets. Do we have this specific Miles Davis recordings? Yes, but is my most played Miles Davis recording? It can tell me that. How much does it cost to acquire more Miles Davis recordings? In this case, it was $1.29 a piece. And can I listen to the entire album or playlist before dinner? Not easily in this case, because you can see it is 1.3 hours uh, on this. So I've done a little bit of definitional material. Let's get into some strategies around how to do this. Uh, again, the idea here is it's critical to understand and to make everybody else understand what it is that you do. If others don't understand what you do, you are perceived as a cost. Whereas if under, others understand what you do, you are perceived as a value. It's a very simple piece of guidance, but it has served us well. And this is what metadata does. It helps represent understanding and use. So data in order to be understood and documented as IE it has metadata specifications, uh, it needs to be understood by two different people looking at the same specifications, same sheet of paper, if you will, think of musicians trying to read music. But it's also important to understand that this implies that the same understanding is, here, is shared by humans and systems as well. Organizations have taken different approaches to metadata. I mentioned, uh, or Shannon mentioned in the, uh, the bumper up top that I spent some years with Walmart. And when they looked at metadata, they said, oh, fantastic. We can incorporate part of the Walmart logo in there. And Walmart said, metadata is any combination of any circle and data in the center that unlocks the value of that particular data. It also should show you that for every piece of data, you can have multiple pieces of metadata around it, which means there's more metadata than there is data. Ooh, this could become problematic. Hold that thought for just a second. And again, shout out to Brad Melton out there at uh, Walmart who came up with that particular example. It's a very powerful one, I believe. Uh, if you look at Outlook, however, uh, Outlook will do the same kind of thing. Here's a screenshot from my Outlook in the upper right hand corner and the what information that comes in there gives me the subject the priority uh user id in my inbox where 
The why is the body of the letter. The when is the sent and received. And I, of course, just like all of the rest of you, use Outlook to weed out important stuff uh, so I can find the good stuff among all the junk. I can organize future access with a series of Outlook rules so that I can, anytime something comes in from one of my bosses, it goes straight to the top of my uh, inbox in order to do this. Just imagine trying to manage email if Outlook did not make use of the metadata in this case, the who from and to, it would be very, very difficult. So metadata is, if you will, everywhere in all of our systems. It is data, excuse me, metadata is to data what data is to real life. So data reflects real life transactions and metadata reflects data transactions around it. In some ways, it's very much like the digital twin concept. Uh, my colleague, David Hay has a wonderful book out that dives into that a lot more detail uh, around this, but I wanna, bring up the Gartner definition here that I think is so important. Gartner defines metadata as saying, metadata unlocks the value of data and therefore it requires management attention. Okay, so now let's go to metadata management, a set of processes that allow us to ensure metadata. Again, at this point in your organization, all of your knowledge workers have learned data on their own is very likely a true statement. And in addition to that, they've also then learned metadata management on their own as well, which means they've all learned it differently. That's a problem for most everybody. And metadata, as you can see here, is ubiquitous. Let's get to the bottom line. What is a gerund then? Why is it Peter says you can't use it as a noun? Well, the reason is one person's data is another person's metadata. Any piece of data can be used as metadata. Any piece of metadata can be used as data. So the use of the term metadata is really more of a verb than a noun. The proper term for it is gerund. It's a form that's derived from a verb, but functions as a noun. Therefore, metadata describes a use of a data, not a type of data. Very important distinction. And the value proposition associated with that is really key to understand because since 80% of your data is redundant, obsolete, or trivial, there's no point in maintaining metadata about rot data uh, in there. And we can now start to focus in and get what we're really trying to do. Here's an example. Again, this is just if you want to read more about this, but it was the first time that people realized that even looking at new systems could be useful uh, in understanding metadata. So here's, for example, the way PeopleSoft used to ship uh, their PeopleSoft modules around uh, administer workforce, compensate employees, and develop workforce three primary modules of PeopleSoft that it had in there. And the people who were encountering it for the first time said, well, where do I learn about this? And we simply tallied the number of sub-modules in each of those sections, showing that they were, relatively speaking, about equal in that. But if we looked at the expansion of the administer workforce in there, you can see that recruiting workforce and maintaining competencies is much more complex than planning successions and managing positions uh, around that. So perhaps not perfect metadata, but certainly useful metadata. Here's another use of it here. This is the old system that we had here at Virginia Commonwealth University many, many moons ago. Uh, Anthony Danielson is still out there as a former student. Say hey to him as well as Chris Diggs and some of the others. But here's the database that is behind it. In other words, the metadata that is looking at this. And all I really have to do to help you understand this particular screen is describe this as a series of parent and child relationships. The parent is something here in the upper left-hand corner that I've circled called Student Database Master, SDBM. And everything else is a child ranging off of that. So even though you can't read anything about this metadata database, you certainly understand it. And more importantly, you understand it well enough that if I show you that this was the actual proposed system to replace that original system, you can see here that this is an absolute travesty and uh, whoever was doing this had no idea what they were in fact doing. There is almost a jail story in there, but uh, I'll have to wait till the Q&A if you wanna hear about that. That said, IBM did at one point put together what they believed was all the metadata that you would ever need into something called the IBM AD cycle. And uh, there is a website out there that has this stuff. Again, it goes into our, here's a great place to get started on some of these particular pieces. But the, the more important piece from this little definitional section is that people, when they understand metadata, they start running around their organization and looking at stuff and saying, is this metadata? Is this metadata? Is this metadata? The answer to that question is always it could be metadata. So the real question to ask is not, is this metadata? But would we obtain value 
if we include this particular metadata within the scope of our metadata management practices. Because if you just collect metadata about everything and you recognize that 80% of your data is redundant, obsolete, or trivial, you will be doing a lot of work for not a lot of value in that process. Let's move on to our second strategy then. Enforce metadata to be the language of data governance. The reason for that is critical. Let's just talk about what data is for starters. Data, if I use the word 42, uh, that can be a piece of data and I can associate it with a book that I'm very fond of, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where 42 in this context means the meaning of life, universe, and everything. Some of you will know what we're talking about. Others are completely confused. Let's change. 42 also was Jackie Robinson's jersey. Again, a very happy set of associations associated with that particular number. Or here's a third association with that number. It represents my age 21 years ago. Well, the question of whether Peter is allowed to consume adult beverages in the Commonwealth of Virginia, where he resides, is obviously answerable by that particular piece of data. So data are facts paired with meanings. The data, of course, shows up in lots of different places. So we have to differentiate between just data and useful data, data that we actually find useful. How do we find it useful? Well, when data is turned into information, it is usually done so in response to a request. So if we take some data and find out what data has been requested, we now know we have information as a result of that. And of course, it's obvious from this structure so far that you can have data without information, but you can't have information without data. So all of the information literacy programs and things that are out there, I think are pretty silly uh, because they're really not focusing on the right issue. There's one more level for this as well. How is the information used? Well, we've called this over the decades that I've been in the business, wisdom, knowledge, and intelligence. Uh, it'll probably come up with some new term as we go forward on this, but notice I've given you a fairly good metadata structure there. Data is a combination of facts and meaning. Information is data that has been provided in response to a request. These are objective criteria. And then intelligence is information that has been strategically used. Again, and this is the most basic form of metadata in order to do this. Let's take it to the next level, which is incorporating strategy in here. The organizational strategy absolutely has to come and be where the data strategy is derived from. What are we doing with data to help the organization achieve its objectives? Similarly, that focus on data strategy has to be the question, what the data assets do to better support strategy is what data governance should be doing. And back at the, the other direction, how well is it working? Gives us some feedback in there as well. We're gonna incorporate the stewards in here as well, just to make sure everybody follows. The business strategy, the organization strategy should be expressed in terms of business goals. And the language I've already said of data governance should be metadata. So given those two pieces, this means that what we're really looking at here is the opportunity, and I'm so sorry, I went too fast on that, uh, is the opportunity for everything to go uh, correctly in a way that keeps things focused on specific actions that will help the organization use data to better achieve its strategic objectives. Uh, if we're doing anything other than that, we may wanna ask the question about where our priorities are around all that process. So there you go is the entire diagram put up there without my errors in keyboarding over top of the whole process. If we use business goals and metadata to confine the language, the vocabulary, the focus of what we're trying to do in both data strategy and data governance, we will much better be able to support the organizational strategy and monitor how effective our support is around that. When we look also at what comprises the data community, of course, IT and systems development are going to be there as supporting infrastructure legs uh, around this. We've got a combination of leadership, stewards, some subject matter experts, and then everybody else that we put in there. Most organizations will draw a line around the left-hand side of this diagram just to talk about that and say this is going to be our data governance operation that we have over here. And the purpose of leadership, of course, is to get resources, obtain feedback from people, make decisions. The stewards are then charged with implementing those decisions. This means they need some action to take and some changes that need to happen in order to do this. Of course, we're still going to continue to 
get data and feedback and ideas all the way in. And once again, if we're doing this without talking about metadata, we are introducing more errors into the process instead of less. So again, our metadata here yields valuable information about the organizational data governance assets and process. Do we have a shared understanding of our goals? Are we in IT focused on similar goals? How effective are we being? There may be some cost per data. And what kind of metadata do we find most useful right now? Well, this particular organization says the supply chain metadata is of most value to the organization at this point in time in our hypothetical uh, uh, example here. All right, number three, strategy. Treat repositories and glossaries as capabilities, not as technology. In most cases, you will see people using the term glossary is where you keep definitions. I cringe when I hear that. Uh, the problem is that, first of all, all data models, all data components are incomplete without definitions. And while definitions are good, purpose statements are generally better than definitions. And I'll show you an example of that here. Uh, of course, all of this then goes back into its all metadata. Let's look at the specific example. This is from the Veterans Administration System, something that I worked on uh, when I was at the federal government at one of my uh, uh, exercises in there. The, the question is, what is the purpose statement? Well, first of all, it says bed. It's a principal data entity, and this is a substructure within a room that's a substructure of a facility and it contains information about beds within rooms. Where did it come from? Well, there's the reference and where it came from. Here are the attributes that it has. Now, that may be a partial or full list. We would like, of course, to know that it is, in fact, the full list. We would not want to have any ambiguity around that. We also are associating this entity with another entity. This, of course, also is metadata, saying that one room contains zero or many beds in order to do this. And finally, all of our models, statements, components are in a draft form until they have been officially validated from that particular process. Now, just a quick little story here. One of the things that we looked at when they looked at the definition uh, about this, this was a very bad definition here. Here was a better definition. Beds are the primary means to be used to track patients within the facility. Each bed will track exactly one patient. Again, it's a terrible, terrible statement because of course the first question that pops up immediately is, okay, so you're gonna use this as the primary means to keep track of this where are we going to put the bed ID attribute? We need to be able to identify this bed from all the other beds that are possibly out there. And second of all, what room is the hallway? What room is the elevator? Those two questions the contractor was unable to answer and consequently unable to implement the entire scheme of keeping track of patients by putting them in beds. Of course, they went to a wristband, which as you know, uh, turned out to be a much better way of doing this. It was kind of an older thing but once again, notice that the purpose statement in the metadata actually saved the government a fair amount of headache in this particular interest. Let me tell you another quick story on glossaries, and this is from Nokia, which is a wonderful company. If you want to read about it, Risto's book here, Transforming Nokia, is just a fabulous one. They originally started out as a tire and rubber products company, moved into consumer electronics. When I had an association with them, they were in mobile phones. And interestingly enough, 2% of the population of Finland speaks Swedish, so the entire higher Finnish population tends to be bilingual. Uh, and Nokia as a company wanted to play internationally, so they mandated the use of English in all business settings. That meant if I went to Finland and had a meeting with Nokia people, as I did for about four years, uh, they spoke in English to me, which was really nice because of course I don't speak Finnish. Uh, in the process of learning this, however, Nokia discovered lots of words were unknown. And culturally, they had to change the focus from saying, don't sit there and pretend everybody else knows it and you're the only one that doesn't know it. In fact, it's culturally bad not to ask questions and good to build a common vocabulary. So when an unfamiliar term was used in a Nokia meeting, the group accessed the NTB to see if there was a golden definition. Uh, I should have made the book, the book uh, golden instead of blue there down in the corner. And the group would vote whether or not to submit it for inclusion, consideration for inclusion in the NTB. And weekly, the NTB group would sit around and review the submissions and then publish new versions of the NTB, which of course, if you haven't figured out at this point, stood for the Nokia term 
bank. One of the best examples I have seen of taking an organization and building a business glossary in a very cost-effective way and in a very culturally sympathetic way in order to do this. Another topic with respect to glossaries is that the conversations between people wanting glossary and the people selling glossary tends to be uneven. There's a technology gap that tends to occur because the customers are not knowledgeable and the vendors, of course, are supremely knowledgeable. A lot of that can be made up through do-it-yourself types of exercises. And I'm going to show you a couple of things right now that hopefully will get you started on them. This is a model that we created for something called FTI, Financial Transactions International. Not uh, relevant in today's environment, but it just happens to contain the data that you would need to keep track of if you wanted to keep track of metadata in your existing systems. So this is the blueprint, if you will, for it. Uh, again, you'll get a copy of the slides for all this, which means you can build your own repository out of something like Microsoft Access. Now, I'm not suggesting that Microsoft Access will function as the repository for your needs for your organization. But if you take and work with one for approximately two years or three years, you will be in very good shape because here's an example of one that was built here. Again, they're looking at a table FT underscore T underscore account. You can see that in the tables uh, entry piece. So you can click on entity domains and return if you wanted to go back to a different screen uh, in this case. But uh, instead, what we're going to do is take a look at how all of this comes together. So here, I'm sorry, different table, FT underscore T underscore ABDF. No way you would figure out what that was, but you can look at the column details. And for each column, you can look and see whether it occurs in a primary key, uh, again, right there, or as a foreign key. Uh, in this case, it does not appear as a foreign key. And then what the actual columns of that table are. This type of build for you is not an expensive process, and you will learn so much from doing this. And all of the basic building blocks exist out there for for you so you don't have to uh, learn this all the way from scratch. So once again, metadata in this context yields, do we have this specific class of assets? Is this data item used elsewhere? Well, we can answer definitively, no, it is not in this instance. Again, cost to acquire, can these assets be shared securely? These are the types of questions that metadata will allow you to answer. Our fourth strategy then is to start from existing building blocks. And the key here is there are lots and lots of things that have been done already. So let's talk about architecture for just a quick bit. Architecture is about things, as in what are these two thing one and thing twos, and the function of those things. They need to know how they do perform their task individually and what type of data that they use as a part of this, and how do these things interact. Well, again, as a pretty abstract set of concepts, these are necessarily in order to figure this stuff out. When we go to a data architecture, then we look at architectures and say details are organized into larger components. And then that means that this is going to be fairly intricate because this organization is now going to be inculcated in subsumed into larger architectural components. So anything that is intricate there, those processes and properties are inherited by the entire models that also then introduce dependencies into the process and architectures, which should introduce purposefulness into the process. Of course, we're going to do that from the data perspective. We've got the attributes for the intricacies. We've got the entities and objects organized into the models for the dependencies and the models organized into architectures in order to do this. And there are lots of examples. I've shown a couple here. Here I've got thing, and you can see the thing ID and the descriptions and things like that that are up there. Uh, you can see the dependencies that I've organized into the model that says one must might eventually have many of these things uh, in order to connect them, but there's no clear necessity to have that intersecting entity existing within there. Uh, and models are then organized into architectures. Of course, there aren't terribly many examples of architectures because most architectures end up kind of looking like this. Again, if you can imagine an enterprise architecture for any of these large organizations, it's going to be big and confused. And of course, it is all metadata in order to look at this. So keep thinking around the process of building towards your data architecture, but you don't need it all at once. You don't need to start it uh, all at once. Uh, it can be built in 
pieces and phases. And notice in this particular architecture, there's a green phase and an orange phase, as well as a purple and a red phase and a teal phase uh, in order to cover all of this up. Uh, I just want to tell a quick story on this particular diagram here, too. This was created by a very smart CIO who knew that the organization was buying a ERP, an enterprise planning program, something think SAP, PeopleSoft, et cetera, et cetera, bond, uh, very many options that are out there in the market. And the management had somehow gotten it in their head that that was going to fix all of their problems. They weren't going to need to have any other systems because of course the salesperson told them this system will, will do everything that you want. <clears throat> so the CIO sat down and maintained this. And this is actually called the quilt diagram uh, by the organization. It was hand done uh, for the first time on this. And it was so useful, they kept reusing it. Uh, so they now have it uh, in const, uh, ensconced in somebody's office. There's an owner of it, just like there's an owner of person letting people on the network and not, uh, as we talked a little bit earlier there, this is how you organize and use your metadata around all of this. And again, it is all metadata because it's data that's being used to leverage other sets of data. Here's another metadata piece here, particularly for design patterns. Uh, Perth, Australia, where Clive used to live. By the way, Clive's the one that came up with the purpose statements uh, on that. Make sure we give him credit for all, all of that. Uh, you know, just a bunch of buildings in, in, in Perth, Australia. Well, it's not anything particular to Perth that the restrooms are located in the same place on each floor. Why is that? Well, because generally restrooms depend on gravity and water to take things away. And so you wanna make sure that they are uh, having the shortest amount of travel time that you possibly can. So even in these large buildings that are here, you can be sure that the efficiency of the restroom uh, is a pattern that they repeated on each floor of the building that they were able to do so because it saves time and money and effort, just the same way as understanding metadata will help your organization understand better its use of the specific uh, systems that you have. And gosh, why would we do anything different with electrical wiring, HVAC, floor plans, et cetera, et cetera? The architecture design patterns are the kinds of things that we will put into all of these buildings and organizations. And there are a number of really good sources that you can use to go and find out about this. Again, I mentioned David Hayes' uh, book before. This is a different book of David Hayes' data model patterns. Uh, David Marco wrote one called Universal Metadata Patterns, uh, Metadata Models. Uh, I've got one called XML in Data Management. It's got patterns in the Bible, if you will, of this is uh, Led Silverstone's three volume set, the Data Model Resource Book. If you can find a copy of that that's still unopened, there do exist, you can find them. Uh, there's actually Irwin models in the back of this book that you can immediately unuse and transfer into your metadata environment right away. Uh, again, true story, Len and I were at a conference in San Diego a couple of years ago. I happened to see him walking by and one of the questions coming from you all was, have you ever found a pattern for a, 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 a cash register operation in a pharmacy? And it turned out Len was able to tell me that's book two, chapter 13. Uh, literally, he was just walking by and remembered that stuff very, very well. Uh, you remember a little while ago, I showed you the model of the data model uh, metadata. Here is a generalized model for maintaining metadata. Again, link to it on my website there that you can go out and take a look to it. But this model here will generally allow you to move things from or to whatever it is you are attempting uh, to get them into or out of uh, in order to do this. So just a very, very useful starting place uh, in order to get this done. There's also some semi-structured uh, metadata, what people tend to call unstructured. I don't like that term because unstructured means you really could convert it to structured. So we can take semi-structured data and we can make it more structured, or better still, probably we can describe non-tabular data as tabular data when we're doing it. But there's descriptive, structural, and administrative metadata around each of these non uh, uh, tabular sets of data that you can use 
in order to better leverage all of this. Uh, again, you might imagine SharePoint is doing exactly that kind of leveraging when we're looking at it. So these metadata patterns, again, yield you various comparisons and starting places. Uh, why would you want to build this pharmacy billing system from scratch when you have access to something that can show it to you right there? Uh, will the proposed software fit with our existing systems? It is now considered best practice when somebody proposes either a cloud-based app or a regular app for you to ask them for a copy of the data model so that you can determine the best fit to your existing infrastructure, your existing architecture. Uh, do these industry best practices exist? Yes, again, they're not only existing, but the federal government is making them into laws, which is a wonderful thing uh, around that. And we can look and say, has anybody published a model for implementing GDPR in this context? In this instance, the answer was no, but uh, again, there may be other instances around all of that. So uh, let's talk about some benefits and applications and sources uh, around all of this. And the first one's a bit scary. Uh, you probably remember President Obama uh, came out at one point and said, okay, well, you know, it's just your metadata. So let's just see what metadata means. Metadata means they know that you, using your mobile device, uh, were on the Golden Gate Bridge because of the geopositioning piece, and you, uh, uh, you know, called a suicide hotline. But, oh, the topic of the call remains secret because it's just metadata. Well, as you can see, all of these questions about metadata allow you to learn more about what's actually happening in the organization. In fact, it's so valuable that many companies have built an entire business around it. Here's an example of a business called Invera that I was peripherally involved with, but I love their commercial for it. So this is literally their commercial. And it says something like, you know, company A and company B talk to each other. And of course there's third parties. And these are all the types of documents that company A and company B might exchange via phone, fax, mail, email, et cetera, et cetera. Even EDI of course comes into the picture. Now, of course we've got XML based transactions. All of this allows us to help. Well. Again, imagine this between A and B, and then imagine A is also not doing business with just B, but also with C, D, and a number of suppliers. And of course, all these folks are talking to each other in the background as well, which means we have a tangled mess of confusion. Watch this part coming up. This is really where the value proposition comes in. The company was called Invera. I'm not sure exactly what it stood for, one of those wonderful Latin words that probably means truth or something around this, but you can see what Invera did was insert themselves in this particular industry as a broker of transactions and things that were in here. It was a 100% metadata-based piece. All they needed to do was connect with either SAP, JD Edwards, whatever the other companies were uh, in order to do this. And they were able to pull all of this together. And again, this is still coming from their advert. The value here was the Invera Clearinghouse that they were going to put in place all of this type of data because they'd have it not just about the companies that they um, had connected up to this, but they could also do industry scanning and find out how their subset of industrial partners compared to everybody else. Again, the metadata skill sets, values, patterns were reusable across a number of different domains. I mentioned before that the federal government was incorporating metadata in it. This is an act that was signed on the 14th of January in 2019. And it mandates the use of best practices, dictionary, term bank, control vocabularies. All of these things are absolutely critical. Don't worry, you're not expected to memorize it as it scrolls by there, you at high speed. But here are the highlights. All federal data is now open by default. Non-political CDOs are required, uh, which means they can't be uh, uh, taken out. They are government employees. They're not political employees. And the use of open data and open models are required in policy evaluation. The last bullet point, however, is what gets everybody. The penalties for violating the FIPA Act are higher than HIPAA. That's enough to make people pay attention right away. So we've talked for very rapidly at a, a, quite a, a distance here of talking about what metadata is in the context of data management. We have to define data management in order to do that. And when we talk about using metadata, we are trying to leverage the data. We may be looking for tags, we may be looking for attributes, we may be looking for the value of attributes, we may be looking for mandatory uh, relationships that exist in here. There's lots of specific things that you can look at. And I've given you an example to use with either your iTunes or your music app 
uh, in order to understand how to do this. Just imagine trying to manage your music collection uh, or movie collection or, or P pod podcast collection without metadata. Of course, it doesn't work. I've given you four specific strategies in order to do this. Everybody learns metadata as a noun, and they tend to run around pointing to things and saying, is this metadata? If it's metadata, we must manage it. That's not the correct. Metadata is a use of data, not a type of data, and you should only use it when it provides you value. Second strategy, enforce language, enforce metadata to be the language of data governance. Uh, again, the idea that I've seen so many people sitting around and arguing about this, that, and the other thing, and they don't even have the terms correctly on here. So what they're arguing about is an exercise that ends up being completely futile. Uh, yes, help make sure that your data governance people are speaking the language of data governance, which is metadata around that. Look at the idea of starting to pull together your glossary repository thing as a capability, not as a technology. It's a cyclical process. You should do a version and then another version and then get more people involved and then make the scope wider. And, and again, crawl, walk and run your way up to the point where you can have a good conversation with our wonderful partners in the vendor community who have some really exciting stuff, uh, as you saw Jesse showed at the beginning of the, uh, the hour up here. And finally, don't start out with a blank sheet of paper. There's nothing that terrifies people more than a blank sheet of paper. There are many, many, many resources to available to help you start to jumpstart these efforts around this. Uh, again, lots of benefits in order to do this. And we're gonna do a couple of quick takeaways and then we'll invite Jesse back here and look to your questions uh, as we get forward on this. So again, benefits. The idea is increasing the value of strategic information. We can use metadata to get rid of the 80% of data that is getting in the way of us obtaining value from the remaining 20%. That we can reduce training costs by simply showing people and documenting this stuff. Uh, staff turnover, I did a, 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 a complete exercise of building out an analytics group completely funded by the cost of people not quitting their job. This particular organization said it cost them $50,000 to rehire people uh, in a particular job, and they would quit because there was no uh, documentation around about what they did. So we put the metadata in place, the turnover rate dropped, and we were able to show documented serious uh, positive costs around that. Uh, business analysts will allow them to find out. Knowledge workers spend almost 80% of their time recreating knowledge that already exists or finding knowledge that exists. If we can help our knowledge workers get to the information that they need to faster, it will help overall productivity in our organizations. And bridging the gap between business users and IT, think of them as disparate musicians trying to sing off the same sheet of paper uh, around this. Again, all of this helps to do time better, faster, right, in order to do this and reduces risk because we have much better control of the change management process. Uh, so again, reducing rework inconsistencies, what Tom Redmond calls hidden data factories uh, around this. So a couple of quick takeaways as we round up to the top of the hour. Again, thinking about it as data about data is a good place to start, but it is so incredibly important to make sure that you get beyond that. Because if people think of it just as data about data, you've already seen that every piece of data has multiple pieces of metadata about it, which means it's just simply impossible. If we're barely managing our organizational data, how are we gonna manage all of the organizational metadata about our data? It's a non-starter uh, on this. So managing data about data, where it provides value. Because metadata does unlock the value of the data and it does require management attention. But it's much less about what and much more about how, which means your organization has to start developing these capabilities. And don't get me wrong, every time I come to visit, I've, I've 
worked with over a thousand companies across my 35 years uh, on this. There are people in your organization who are already doing this and doing it very, very well, but they're buried somewhere and they don't have the visibility. People don't understand it. Again, the quilt diagram story that I told you a couple of minutes ago was somebody doing this and the CIO knew they were doing it and went to them and said, can you enhance the quilt diagram in these certain ways so that I can make this point to management that the new ERP is not going to replace all of our systems that are here. And again, it was it was a very, very good uh, way of, of maintaining that particular piece. We'd like it to be more formal. We'd like it to be more recognized uh, in the process. Again, when your data governance processes are going off the rails, people are sitting in meetings and they're not sure why they're there or what their purpose is or anything else that's going on, this is why you need to be speaking in metadata so that there are real business problems tied to the other end of these data things that happen so that we can get excited about the data things happening and talk about it in terms of metadata successes. Uh, again, the idea is in any organizational challenge, there is a metadata root cause of this. So we need to make sure that we have that in place so we can use it in the way we most likely uh, want to do this. Uh, again, it's not really well understood, but a challenge of any sort is going to have a data component. And if we've defined the data component imprecisely or in many instances wrong, there's simply no way that we will ever be able to, spat, to correctly satisfy the problem on this. That's a different lecture, uh, but we can talk about it perhaps offline around this. And finally, when you do get it right, the question that pops up, should pop up on a regular basis for you is, should we include this data item within the scope of our metadata practices? And the answer to that is yes, if it provides value for you. So I've left you with a couple of uh, recommended reading uh, pieces. It's a fairly long list from the DIMBOK that's out there. But uh, again, lots and lots of places to get started on this. I uh, want to bring you uh, around to this corner just to make sure that you know we're going to do data quality next month uh, on this. And here's the other upcoming pieces. And now it's time to go back to Shannon and invite Jesse to come back in and see what sort of questions you guys have. Peter, thank you so much for this great presentation. And if you have any questions for Peter or for Jesse, feel free to put them in the Q&A portion of your screen. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by the end of Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides, links to the recording, and anything else requested throughout. So diving in here, um, you didn't mention quote unquote standards. Is it necessary to designate metadata standards across the organization? So a great uh, question. Jesse, did he get back on here? I don't know how you guys end up <laughs> yeah. using them, but uh, the, the wonderful thing about standards, of course, is that there's so many out there. You want to go first, Jesse? Go ahead. Well, I, I guess there's two kinds of standards. Whenever I hear the question and I don't, you know, I'm trying to figure out exactly what the context is, there's standards in the sense of like um, requirements and policy level, like we have to do this kind of standards. And then there's actual metadata standards, you know, whether it's to exchange data or the representation of the data, possibly the model of the data. So that, that's what came to mind initially, Peter. Absolutely. And the, the key with it is that many people, as they understand standards and how they work, tend to think of them as perhaps superhuman uh, in that standards can help uh, in order to do this, but standards by themselves will not solve things all the way around. Let me just give you a, a very brief example of this. In the United States, we were unable to describe uniform crime statistics until very recently. Uh, I say recently, it's been the last couple of decades when something called NEME, the National Information Enterprise Information Model, was created and provided the platform and the structure and the standards, of course, to report on crimes because some jurisdictions would report one crime one way and some would report it another way. And we have somewhere in the order of 20,000 individual jurisdictions in the United States reporting crime statistics. So getting all of that together was impossible without standards. And now that we do have standards, we can now start to look at things uh, uh, in a slightly different way. Here's another quick example though. Uh, I 
NACD stands for International Disease Codes, and that went from 4,000 at 9 to 40,000 at 10, and there's going to be many more at 11 uh, in order to do this. We do need increasing levels of, of granularity so that we can understand the difference between, and I'm not a doctor, right lung uh, infections versus left lung infections, you know, or something like that. Um, but if we don't have the granularity in the data, we won't be able to, to understand that. So it's a gradual process of moving things through. Um, but yes, standards are, are very important to this, but it's also important to understand the limitations of standards as well. So we get this question a lot, Peter, as you know, um, and we're doing a webinar on it next year. I'm very excited. Um, how can we implement and enforce a data strategy if we don't have C-level sponsorship? It is harder to get people to understand this. I, I can imagine most people listening to an hour of this stuff with the two of us uh, talking would be not excited. Uh, certainly, you know, nothing that makes me want to put my, my coat on and go out and walk the dog or whatever uh, around this. But it is important. And I guess the first thing is that you, you always are going to have to be managing upwards in one form or another in your organization because we haven't incorporated data education at literally anywhere in the curriculum. Think about it for a minute. The only thing that we teach undergraduate students about data is how to build a new Oracle database uh, in the cloud at least now, but it's still a new Oracle database. Uh, if there's a skill we do not need any more of on planet earth, it is how to build a new database uh, around this. So people are not aware that they don't know. And so it's a really good idea to find a way of relating to them in some sort of an elevator pitch type story. And I, I've got several organizations that I've worked with where we have these sort of pet stories that come up. I've got one organization where I'll sit down and start talking to them about metadata issues and somebody will eventually stop and say, wait a minute, Peter, are you gonna tell us the chocolate story again? It's like, no, I don't have to because you all remember it. Good for you, right? They finally learned that particular lesson. But it's, I think, rarer at the top levels to, to really get that buy-in. And the only thing that they really understand is the bottom line. Or if it's a mission-oriented organization, uh, again, part of the government or something, it's, it's the impact uh, to the bottom line. So you have to translate that metadata into it. Uh, and again, Jesse, I'll go one more example here and then kick it over to you guys to to see how you do it. But one of the things we've all come out of the other side of COVID, hopefully okay on this, there's a, a good set of stories out of the United Kingdom where they had people taking, keeping track of COVID cases on, using Microsoft Excel. Now, why would a person who's a healthcare professional need to understand which version of Excel that they're on? And the answer turns out to be that if you're on Excel uh, with a .xls file, it simply drops rows after 16,000. Now, how would a healthcare professional know that any rows that they were entering uh, at the top of the spreadsheet were causing rows at the bottom of the spreadsheet to simply fall off? Well, that's a little piece of trivia and metadata that they wouldn't necessarily have known, but in this case did cause the United Kingdom to make some decisions that they perhaps wouldn't have made otherwise if they had had the correct data because the metadata was incorrect about that. Jesse, how do you guys look at selling to metadata when you're trying to, to work with organizations to help them solve the problems that they're facing? Yeah, and you know, bringing it to the sea level, right? Working up. Um, in your slides, Peter, you mentioned governance and um, C-level people, CDOs, um, they, they wanna hear about governance and uh, tying that into your message is really important because metadata is what is governable. Um, and I, I can't recall exactly how you talked to it in the slides, Peter, but that was important. And so when you take metadata up the chain, bring things like governance and how and why with you, right? They wanna hear use cases, applicability, and the fact that you can do something like governance around it. It also is important to help them with the value proposition there. Uh, again, one of the other things that we talk about in data governance in particular, and you're right, executives are more concerned about data governance because they've all been exposed to corporate governance. And so uh, any executive that hasn't had a, a set of uh, education around corporate governance is probably going to make a, an error pretty quickly uh, in, in today's environment uh, to do this. So when we talk about what we're trying to govern, one of the things we have to have is a list of those assets. 
So if you were trying to keep data about something, what are the list of data items that you are taking care of? And even if that list exists in somebody's head, I've got a great picture of a guy named Ron in one of my uh, organizations that I worked with. And he's got a, a, he's standing in front of a projector that has the word data on his head. You know, so it's, a, it's obviously making fun of him for being sort of data, but actually the way they operated in that organization, instead of a glossary, they went to Ron and said, Ron, where's this thing connected to these things? And where's this? And Ron had it all in his head. It was great. Great. And as long as Ron doesn't win the lottery and uh, disappear from that organization, they'll probably be just fine. But as you can imagine, there's some people in corporate risk that are saying, ah, I don't think that's the way we're going to go into it. But it is always the case that you're going to have to manage upward. We just haven't done a good job as a society of telling people how to do this well. We're saying data governance is managing data with guidance. Well, what type of guidance should we have? Well, if we're reporting crime statistics, then we should be using NEEM as the standard for reporting crime statistics, or our crime statistics will be not integratable within the larger picture uh, around all of that. And Jesse, Which, let me ask from a, oh, sorry, go ahead, you, please go ahead. I, I was just gonna say, Peter, you know, it takes us back to the first question. What about standards? And you you brought it all together there. So Jesse, when somebody's looking at buying some of your technology, how far up do you have to go in order you know, to the techies look at your stuff and go, oh, that's fantastic. We've got budget. Here we go. Let's do it. Or do you have to sell to their bosses occasionally? B both. Um, mm -hmm. One or the other may be coming at us. Uh, they might be coming at us very well organized together with a purpose. Um, but a lot of times it might be something like, you know, the techies come in, they're interested and they're like, this is great. Can you even help us bring the message uh, up the chain? And we'll do that. We'll collaborate with them, help them with their use cases and uh, define, you know, uh, what we would call like, a, you know, a, a go live charter. What would it take to get you to success? And then that's a that's a good communication piece uh, to work up the chain with. And management at some level is going to be concerned with what's on my plate and what's on somebody else's plate. And if this is on my plate and it's going to help my numbers, they'll pay attention to it. Yeah. And, you know, if you can show that you can make their numbers better without them ha having to do much, because what you're trying to propose is bringing solutions that other people are putting in place and everyone gets to benefit from it. That's a that's a really important part of the story. Fantastic. Super. Great question. Thank you. I love it. So what should companies do with their rot data? <laughs> so from, from a risk perspective, the, the answer is they should get rid of it. Um, again, I don't know if you're doing business with the federal government these days, but uh, the federal government is actually sending out things from various agencies that are now saying uh, this email is subject to a seven-year retention policy. Uh, I've seen that happen in, in several cases uh, in order to do that. Yeah, it's it's a it's a tough process uh, in order to do it. Jesse, you want to jump in? It, it's, it, I, I like the uh, get rid of the rot um, analogy, right? So it, it's the truth, but that's what a lot of times entire efforts have to be dedicated to. Um, maybe we're at a point to where it's like easy to be monitoring and um, aware of our retention policies, but then how do you even get rid of the rot? And then there's standards to follow and policies to follow to, to, to get rid of it. So it, it, the life cycle of data and metadata includes rot. That's Absolutely. just something that you have to face up front. And, and Jesse, I'm going to say I'm a couple years older than you, and, and I have boxes around the house from the last time I moved, which was almost 20 years ago that have never been unsealed. Uh, so that's how I'm going to get rid of my rot. <laughs> when I look around and say, <laughs> I sit, if I haven't needed it in 20 years, I'm probably not going to need it in the next 20 years. Yeah, it, it is tough, and I'm sure that's not what the question was. I, I think the question was probably focusing in more on that. How can we use metadata to actually identify rot? And that's mm. probably a more interesting question because when you discover, for example, well, let's just toss a couple of statistics out. The average organization has customer data stored in 13 different places around the organization. So there's a number for you all. If you have fewer than 13, you are above average. If you have more than 13, you are now below average. Well, how would you use this? Well, you might wanna look at some of the technologies and Jesse, maybe you can give an example of this. 
uh, uh, with the knowledge graph that you were talking about before, but to say, you know, let's go out there and do some scanning and find out, oh, look at this. I've got exactly 13 instances of where customer is. Then the question comes up, which is the one that's getting updated, right? So how do we go into that? Right? How would you guys approach something like that from a metadata well, perspective? You know, it, the the knowledge graph allows us to bring all of the different assets together, right? The the arcs in the graph are the who, what, why, when, and, and where's. Um, the assets themselves can have metadata attached to them. So whenever you get something like, you know, I've got X and I found X in 13 different places. Well, we need metadata about those 13 different places. For that kind of data, which one of those 13 is supposed to be the source of truth? That alone will get you a step in the right direction, let alone starting to flag the other ones as, uh, you know, necessary rot cleanup, um, mm -hmm. uh, attaching, you know, and indicating, you know, because of this policy and regulation right here, you know, section 1.1.1.12 says that you're not even supposed to be storing that kind of information anymore. So now you're down to 12 and it's, it's an incremental uh, path. New organizations, how wonderful would it be to be able to be aware of all of this from the get-go? Don't get yourself in the situation of having 13 places storing the same information, but most organizations are working in the, in the reverse pattern. They're gonna have more than 13 places storing the same information. And we need metadata about the metadata, about the metadata, and then we can make decisions on that, right? And that's the power. Our, our system allows us to query that and visualize it and bring it up and build reports so that you can be made aware of that. But whenever it comes down to it, it's what metadata did you go and collect? Not just on the, um, where the stuff is, but the information about the source, where it is actually. I, uh, great example, Jesse, on that. I, I like to say that one of the responsibilities of the data steward community that I'm showing on the screen here right now is not just to understand what happens to the data when it's in front of them. That's absolutely critical for them, but they also have to know where it comes from and where yep. it's going. And if yep. you have that more broader perspective, then you will be able to say, oh, well, we're all drawing from the same place. So we should all use this as the golden source and try to get rid of these other uh, sources. And as you said, you may go from 13 to 12, but that's still moving you above average. And there's only 12, 11 more that you need to knock out uh, in order to go and get the rest of them. Everyone, everyone is speaking the language these days of lineage and provenance. And I've even been hearing things about pedigree, um, mm -hmm. you know, more and more, which, you know, was probably more of a topic 10 years ago, but it's like it's coming back. So um, especially when you're starting to talk to the C-level individuals, when you're talking up the chain, describe lineage, describe provenance and even pedigree uh, of your data. And that helps tell the story and frames this idea of why do, why do we need to get rid of the 13? Or why do we want to at least be aware of the 13? It, it all starts to fall in that language of lineage and provenance. Again, just because I've been around uh, for a while, I've seen many times, too many times, where two people will be at a meeting in front of a C-level executive and they're arguing about whether sales are up or down. And you know, they, they can't both be right. Sales are either higher this year or lower this year than last year. But if they can't agree among themselves on that because they're not using metadata practices correctly, uh, you certainly don't want that information going up the chain any further. Uh, well, boss, we're not sure whether we're making more or less money this year than last year. Yep. Shannon. Yes. So uh, I love this next question. Uh, a little bit of snark. So, you know, you're talking about the dictionary, uh, metadata being a noun or a gerund, right? It, the dictionary says gerunds and an ing. So should it be metadating then? Metadata-ing, metadating, you know, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it gets in there and uh, we're going to have to work on it. And, you know, again, we don't teach people what metadata is as part of college if you're in an IT program. So there is an opportunity here for us to redesign the vocabulary and, and properly get it straight. So if we want to conform to the rules, then maybe we ought to make it into metadata-ing, right? 
first thing to define is metadata, the word Absolutely. metadata. Absolutely. Jesse, are you a, an English major? I, I, and no, no comment on this one. <laughs> I, am, I am not an English major, so I, I definitely can uh, uh, plead the uh, uh, ignorance on that one, but it seems to work uh, in general. But yes, uh, the ING piece is a, an important component. So, um, you know, what are the, what tools do you need for metadata management? Jesse, I'll let you do that one right right away, right? Uh, go to topquadrant.com. Uh, joking, <laughs> joking, right? Uh, tools. Um, you, you know, uh, without without the bias of saying, you know, uh, a knowledge graph approach, it's uh, it's anything, right? People, Excel rules the world right now. Excel is where metadata is. Um, we, uh, you know, it was funny, Peter mentioned access. We still extract data from access and bring it into 2022 representation uh, and make it interactable with other information. So whatever tool you have at hand, uh, I, maybe that's what Peter was alluding to in his slides, uh, get started. That's the most important thing. Uh, and use tools and capabilities that you have. Draw pictures in PowerPoint if you have to, to start messaging the information. Um, but then as you mature and you want to start using collaboration tools and you want to start having controlled workflows, getting people to do the right metadata at the right time in the right place, that's when more of the advanced kind of tooling will come in and really help you. But that doesn't mean everyone needs it you know what I mean, just being completely open and honest, not everyone needs that advanced level yet, but you will get there eventually. And that's where, you know, maybe a system like Top Rate Edge is exactly what you need so that it can help you with all of that more advanced social side, management side of everything. Um, but uh, yeah, it doesn't mean that you need that on day one. Use anything you've got on day one. I have seen many organizations, I know that several people on the uh, uh, delegates list at this point have built their own repositories uh, in order to do this. And yes, the use of any tool at all is better than the use of no tools. And once you've graduated from that, then you have to say, all right, now what tools should we use? So I'll tell you guys a little metadata story that was uh, one of the big banks that I worked with. Uh, they had done a, a scan of their systems, and even though Jesse said uh, it can do it with access, and nothing wrong, access is a perfectly good tool, but access has been sunsetted by Microsoft, and so mm -hmm. consequently, this organization looked around and said, uh-oh, we have 400,000 production access databases. Now, that's a pretty scary 400,000 access databases in production. And they said, we need to fix that. We need to get rid of each and every one of them. And it took them 10 years, but they did it exactly the way Jesse described. They started out with spreadsheets. They moved it into yet another access database. That was ironic on their part. Uh, then they decided that they'd actually put the uh, thing in Oracle because they had their metadata environment tied into Oracle so that they could actually operate their metadata out of uh, this particular technology. And it took them 10 years that they got rid of each and every one of those 100, excuse me, 400,000 production access database sets. And they are absolutely certain there are no production access database uh, databases running production in their environment today. Now that's an accomplishment. It was a big area of corporate risk. I'm not sure there's a dollar value tied to that uh, in there, but I do know that they assessed it from a risk perspective that it was critically uh, important for their organization. So yes, absolutely, you can use this to, to try and get in there. And again, remember, metadata is use of data in a different format. And so that's all you're doing is sort of thinking a little bit differently about how you're using your existing data and how can I use that to better leverage the overall data in support of your data strategy, which is supporting your organizational strategy. Jesse, you want to add something? Nope, nope. You covered it well there, Peter. All right. Hey, well, I, that does bring us to the end of the questions. I'll let you we all- We covered them all. Hit them out of the park, Jesse. Oh. All right. <laughs> Everyone's 
a little quiet out there today. Well, they're actively chatting. I was trying, I was looking through the chat to see if there's anything else that we wanted to cover, but it's been pretty, you know, we've covered the major discussions here, I think. Um, yeah, so Jesse, thank you so much for joining us again. And thanks to Top Quadrant for helping sponsor again and making these webinars happen. Peter, thanks as always for another great webinar. I see you've got the schedule up there and we're putting together 2023 agenda, which I'm very excited about, um, as always, um, which will be our 13th year in there protection next year. <laughs> so, and just to, thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We just love the chat and the networking going on, as always. And just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday to y'all with links to the slides and links to the recording. Hope you all have a great day. Jesse, thanks for joining us today. Shannon, thank you as always. Yes, thank you, Peter and Shannon. Thanks, guys.